Merhabalar, Aksaray Üniversitesi Felsefe Bölümü olarak hem Sosyal Bilgiler ve Değerli Eğitimi Uygulama ve Araştırma Merkezi hem de Felsefe Topluluğu adına düzenlediğimiz Analitik Hukuk Felsefesi programına hoş geldiniz. Ben Felsefe Bölümü Araştırma Görevlisi Reyhan Yılmaz. Konuğumuz kendisinden ders alma şansına da sahip olduğum Dr. Lars Wings, Cambridge Üniversitesi Hukuk Fakültesi Öğretim Üyesi. Hocam hoş geldiniz, welcome. We are very pleased to meet you today. Yes, I'm, I'm very glad to, to be here and, and to have the opportunity to uh, respond to your questions. It's my honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to introduce you first. Uh, I will continue in Turkish for that. Uh, öncelikle ben hocamızla tanışmak istiyorum. Uh, hocamız Heidelberg Üniversitesi'nde tarih, felsefe ve siyaset bilimi alanlarında yüksek lisans eğitimini tamamladıktan sonra doktora derecesini Toronto Üniversitesi Felsefe bölümünden almıştır. E, doktora sonrası araştırmaları için de İtalya'da Avrupa Üniversite Enstitüsü'nde bulunmuş, e, sonrasında Bilkent Üniversitesi Felsefe bölümünde ders vermiştir. Şu anda Cambridge Üniversitesi Hukuk Fakültesi'nde ders vermektedir. E, çalışma odağı hukuk ve siyaset felsefesi ile birlikte e, anayasa teorilerini kapsamaktadır. Hans Kelsen ve Karl Schmitt'in Hukuk teorileri hakkında makaleleri ve kitapları yayınlanmıştır. E, programımız soru cevap şeklinde devam edecektir. E, ben öncesinde bazı sorular e, sizden aldım, toparladım. E, ben onları soracağım ama sizin de sorularınız olursa, e, açıklanmasını istediğiniz yerler olursa e, veya karşı argümanlarınız olursa yorum kısmına yazabilirsiniz. E, aynı zamanda etkinliğimiz hem İngilizce hem Türkçe olarak devam edecektir. Ben elimden geldiğince e, Türkçe aktarmaya çalışacağım. E, soruların kapsamı analitik felsefe ekolünün hukuk felsefesi alanında e, nasıl bir yöntem izlediğini anlamaya yönelik olacak. E, bu bağlamda ben ilk sorumu e, hocamıza analitik ekolün e, diğer bildiğimiz işte e, normatif ve eleştirel hukuk teorilerine e, farkını sormak istiyorum. Uh, hocam, how do you view the differences among uh, analytical jurisprudence, normative jurisprudence, and critical theories of law? How do you think analytic uh, jurisprudence differs from others? Um, yes, so perhaps um, in responding to that, um, I should uh, point out that, um, that the talk of analytical jurisprudence may be ambiguous in, in a certain way. So. Um, I take it that one way to understand the phrase analytical jurisprudence is just to say that it's a form of legal theory which is um, influenced by um, the general um, toolkit or, or the methodology of analytical philosophy. Um, but sometimes the, the term analytical jurisprudence, in, at least in, in the context of legal theory, is used in um, a slightly different way. So it's, it's um, used to refer to um, the, the positivist tradition um, or predominantly positivist tradition in legal theory that starts with um, the 19th century author um, John Austin, who was the first professor of jurisprudence at University College London um, in the you know, first half of the 19th century. Um, and so Austin's legal theory is uh, often referred to as analytical jurisprudence and um, authors who belong to the tradition of, of theorizing about law that he that he began are, are also often referred to as exponents of analytical jurisprudence. But of course, analytical philosophy as a general philosophical approach did not exist in the early um, or the first half of the 19th century. Um, so I guess one, one needs to distinguish between these um, two understandings of the phrase analytical jurisprudence. And what I'm going to do is to say a few words about um, the Austinian tradition of jurisprudence and, and perhaps um, I'll try to explain as well how, how it might have come to be related um, to, to analytical jurisprudence and the other, the first sense where it is understood as the use of the methods of analytical philosophy and jurisprudence. Hmm. So, so Austin's jurisprudence is uh, different? Yeah, let me just begin by uh, trying to characterize it and then uh, I hope that um, things will become a little bit clearer. So, okay. So Austin was, was someone who was interested in offering um, uh, a general theory of law, a theory of law that was supposed to apply to uh, all the examples or all the uh, different instantiations um, 
all possible instantiations, I suppose, of a legal order or a legal system. So a general question is, well, we distinguish law, we distinguish legal rules from other types of rules, from moral rules, for instance, or from rules of etiquette. Um, and of course, uh, a question that a philosopher might ask is, what, what is the characteristic that makes legal rules different from all these other rules? What is the um, defining characteristic? What is the essential feature of law? And so Austin tried to answer that question, um, and he tried to, to do so um, by offering a theory that was supposed to be um, descriptive and not um, evaluative. So Austin thinks that we ought to distinguish between um, the aim to, to describe the law, to define the law, um, to figure out what law is, and the normative question of what content law must have in order to be good or morally justifiable law. So this uh, second question, the normative question, is what defines normative jurisprudence. And Austin thinks that one can um, answer the first question, the question, what is law, um, in purely descriptive terms without offering any moral assessment of uh, legal order. And so that is the, how the distinction between analytic jurisprudence, I guess, and normative jurisprudence is uh, typically understood um, in the jurisprudential tradition. And so Austin, of course, had, had a very, very simple um, answer to the question, what is law? So his, his answer was to say that in every society where there is a legal system, there is a sovereign, sovereign authority. And a sovereign is just defined as someone who is uh, habitually obeyed by all the members of the society while not paying obedience to anyone else. And Austin claimed that, well, the laws are just, um, or the rules that, that as legal theorists we would be concerned with, are just the commands um, uh, that have been given by this sovereign um, to the members of a community that, that determine what people are required to do or permitted to do or not permitted to do. Um, that is what law is. Law is the command of the sovereign. Um, and of course, it, if, if you accept this view, then it follows that, suppose you're, you're um, drawn towards a legal positivist account of the nature of law, one that claims that there is no necessary connection between law and morality, because a rule might have been enacted by um, a sovereign w without being just, without being morally justifiable in terms of its content. So here you can see how analytical and normative jurisprudence are neatly separated. Um, and of course, this, um, this tradition that Austin started to account for what the law is was later um, continued by other authors like Kelsen and Hart in particular, who is still, I guess, the most uh, important legal theorist um, in, in the contemporary debate or whose theory is still the main uh, point of reference. And, and so these later theorists were, were drawn to Austin's idea that the legal theory should not be morally evaluative, but um, they thought that his account of what the law is is too simplistic. So you find more elaborate, more, uh, more, more uh, finely worked out versions of um, a positivist theory of the law and as the tradition continues. Um, now, what, what I should say, of course, is that um, there are also some people who are uh, skeptical of the possibility of um, uh, a purely descriptive analytical jurisprudence. So um, contemporary natural law theorists like, like Ronald Dworkin or John Finnis have argued in, in a number of different ways that it's not possible to, to give an, an answer to the question what the law is without um, addressing questions of moral justification. Um, and so, so there is, uh, uh, I guess, an, an, a dispute within the tradition that Austin started as to whether um, the project is really feasible as Austin conceived of it or not. And I guess the, the main debates in, in contemporary uh, jurisprudence, I guess, revolve around that question. Hmm. Um, yeah, so perhaps just to, to wrap this up, there was a final element to the question on critical theories of law. Um, so I suppose about these, I, I, I know less than about um, the distinction between analytical and normative jurisprudence, but um, critical legal theory, I guess, um, is often associated with, with the term um, that the law is uh, radically indeterminate um, in, in the sense that general legal rules um, 
uh, can be interpreted or applied in whichever way a judge or someone else who applies a law may please, and therefore um, are unable to, to restrain or to control the exercise of power on the part of um, agents of the state. And so if, if that view is uh, correct, then of course our, our notion of the rule of law um, is in trouble, um, and, and it makes no sense to, to say that the law is at least potentially um, a, a tool um, to control the exercise of state power in ways that we find uh, morally desirable. Um, and so I suppose both uh, Hart and Dworkin as the, as the two most important exponents um, of, of um, either natural law theory or legal positivism in the contemporary debate have engaged with this claim and have criticized it in different ways. Um, but uh, other than that, I suppose the, the, the wider concerns perhaps of, of critical legal theory are, are usually not very strongly reflected in, in analytical jurisprudence. So um, we see the term sovereignty in Austin, uh, very, it takes very big part, I guess, in his philosophy. That's true, I understand correctly. Okay, yeah. uh, then, uh, but the work in Anfinis, uh, unlike Austin, they uh, come close to uh, normative uh, arguments. Yes, so, so I mean, one, one problem, um, with Austin's, or there are several problems with Austin's view. And Hart himself, I guess, who is uh, in, in certain respects um, are trying to continue Austin's project, offers um, the key criticisms of Austin. Um, and and so, so there are a number of uh, shortcomings of Austin's uh, account of law, as I have portrayed it, um, that, that seem to indicate that, that the view is um, that the, is, that the view is unable to properly describe how a legal system, how a legal order works, in fact. So, um, I mean, one, one implication of Austin's view, just to give you a flavor of this, is um, that for there to be a legal system, there must be a sovereign, right? Because um, laws are sovereign commands. There can be no laws unless there is a sovereign. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what is a sovereign? Well, a sovereign is someone who is... Um, uh, obeyed, habitually obeyed, as a matter of fact, by the members of a society, but who is not controlled or who doesn't obey anyone else. So as a result, Austin thinks that the powers of a sovereign are um, by necessity incapable to, to be subject to legal limitations. Okay. Um, now, you might ask yourself, of course, well, um, if that is how, how a legal order works, um, what should we say about a constitutional state where um, there are certain rules that um, we believe um, control the exercise of state power in ways that, that no organ of the state can just shrug off or disregard. So um, in a constitutional state, there doesn't seem to be uh, a sovereign understood as uh, an uncommanded commander. So this was Hart's phrase to describe Austin's sovereign. And so it seems that Austin will be forced to conclude either that um, in, in, a, in a constitutional state, um, well, there isn't really law because there is no sovereign, um, no mm -hmm. political power capable of commanding everyone else. Or the other possibility would be to argue that um, the constitutional state is sort of a mere facade in a way. And, and, and behind the um, facade of constitutional normativity, um, there must still be um, somewhere a sovereign authority that is normatively uncontrolled. So this is the, the kind of view perhaps that one might associate with Carl Schmidt. But, but Hart thought, of course, that both of these views are, um, are wrong. They are just false as descriptions of a modern constitutional state. So we need a, a theory that can do without um, the notion of a sovereign. And what has happened then in Hart's legal theory and also in Kelsen's, who was an earlier exponent of a somewhat similar perspective, is that um, the, the sovereign has come to be replaced with the idea of a fundamental rule um, mm -hmm. validates the law and authorizes legal decision takers, which, which Hart calls a rule of recognition. Mm -hmm. And this rule um, for Hart, um, it's, it's not put in place by a sovereign, it's not commanded by anyone, it just exists as a social, or as a result of a social practice of legal officials um, to use certain standards for the validation of law. And in this way you have um, uh, um, theory that, that still grounds law and social fact, but not in um, sovereign authority. Mm -hmm. 
so, so basically the Austrian view has now fallen out of favor um, because it is seen to be descriptively inadequate even by positivist point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, uh, try to uh, tell this in Turkish yeah. to our audience. Uh, şimdi analitik hukuk felsefesi olarak e, analitik hukuk felsefesinin Austin e, tarafından 19. yüzyılda başlatılan bir akım olduğunu e, anlatıyor hocamız. E, Austin 19. yüzyılın ilk yarısında Londra'da e, bu çalışmalarını yürütüyor. E, ve aslında analitik hukuk felsefesi dediğimizde bir e, alet çantası gibi düşünmeliyiz diyor ve bu biraz... E, çok belirgin bir terim değil aslında diyor. Ve Austin'in aslında genel olarak e, hukuk terimini anlatmak için ve hukuk teriminin temel özelliği nedir? Aslında bunu anlatmaya çalışıyor, bunu araştırmaya çalışıyor Austin. Ve e, değerlendirmeci değil, descriptive yani tanımlayıcı bir e, felsefe sürdürüyor. Bunu görüyoruz Austin'de ve aynı zamanda Austin'de e, moral yani ahlaki, değerlendirmelerin yapılmadığını görüyoruz. Hukukla bunların doğrudan ilişkilendirilmediğini görüyoruz. E, ve e, sovereignty yani hükümdarlık kavramının e, öne çıktığını görüyoruz Austin'de diğerlerinden farklı olarak. E, bu da e, aslında Austin'in kastettiği bir hükümdarlık varsa ve yani bir boyun eğilen bir e, otorite varsa e, bir legal hukuk sisteminden bahsedebiliriz ve bu da aslında komentlerle yani emirlerle yürüyen bir sistem olduğunu görüyoruz ve eleştirel hukuk teorilerini ha bu arada aslında Hart'ın yani analitik hukuk felsefesinin normatif Hukuk felsefesiyle aslında çok da e, düzgün bir şekilde ayrılmadığını ve aslında ikisinin birbiriyle çelişmediğini görüyoruz. Çünkü Hart'ın hem analitik hukuk felsefesi hem de normatif hukuk felsefesiyle uğraştığını görüyoruz. E, Dworkin ve Finis de e, Austin'e e, karşı bir argüman olarak normatif bölgeye sapmadan e, yasanın ne olduğuna dair bir açıklama sunamayacağını iddia ediyorlar. Yani bu iki projenin analitik hukuk felsefesi ve normatif hukuk felsefesinin ayrı tutulabileceği genel olarak kabul edilmiyor. Bunu görüyoruz. Bu konuda Dworkin'e de gelelim. Eleştirel hukuk teorilerinin hukukun sistematik olarak belirli çıkarlara doğru çarpıtıldığını göstermeye başladıkları sürece belki de negatif bir normatif hukuk biçimi sunuyor gibi görebilir. Önemli bir kritik temada e, hukukun radikal bir şekilde belirsiz olduğu şeklindeki hukuki gerçekçi iddia, genel hukuk normları yargıçların ne zaman, e, her zaman takdir yetkisi kullanması için belirli bir davaya nasıl karar verileceğini her zaman belirleyemezse hukukun normatif otoriteye yönelik iddialarını desteklemek zor görünüyor. Hem Dworkin'in hem de Hart'ın teorileri de e, bu zorluğun üstesinden gelmeyi amaçlıyorlar. Ee, ve aslında Hart'ta da şey görüyoruz, e, comment yani emirler yerine aslında anayasayı görüyoruz. E, Schmidt'te de bunu görüyoruz. Bu noktada Austin'den ayrılıyorlar. E, şimdi başka bir soruya geçeceğim. E, I will move on to another question if you like. E, well, we talked about Austin, we mentioned him uh, first time. E, well, I will... I want to ask to uh, if he has any uh, specific way of doing philosophy and uh, you mentioned uh, how he describes analytic jurisprudence I will skip that part uh, but I wonder if he has any uh, specific kind of methodology Well that that's hard hard for me to say I guess um so Austin himself uh is sometimes uh, accused of having been some, somewhat naive methodologically, and, and um, he, he did not reflect very extensively, I guess, on um, what, what methodological approach um, should be used in jurisprudence. So um, when, what one can do is to describe what, what in fact he did. Um, and perhaps that's, that's helpful because it, um, 
uh, may may lead to a question about what what analytical jurisprudence is really doing. So, I mean, if you read Austin's book, The Province of Jurisprudence Determined, so what you will find is that um, a, a lot of the um, book is taken up with attempts to define, um, to clearly define certain key legal terms, uh, such as the term law, for instance, and to distinguish um, the, the sort of law that um, a legal theorist should be interested in from other kinds of law, such as natural laws, for instance. So um, a great deal of the book is taken up with the development of um, definitions of legal terms or jurisprudential terms. Um, now, if you look at these definitions, then um, uh, it seems that often um, they, they appear to conflict with um, the way that terms are used or these terms are used in ordinary language. So they give the impression that they are to some extent um, stipulative or that Austin just um, decided to understand law in a certain way, not just to describe um, um, the ordinary language use of the term. Um, and presumably the reason why he, why he did that was that he wanted to, to clarify our thought about the law. So suppose he was interested not merely in, in describing legal terms um, as they are commonly used, but to offer a theory that had explanatory value as a description of um, a certain type of social institution, the social institution that we call law. So as I pointed out earlier, the project is typically understood as an attempt um, to try to outline the defining characteristics of that social institution. But uh, as, as I have also tried to indicate already in my answer to the to the first question, so Austin himself seems to have been um, unsuccessful to some extent in, in uh, describing the um, essential characteristics of law in a fitting or proper way, because um, his definition of law does not seem to fit um, legal orders that, that we would recognize as legal, that, that we think a good legal theory must account for or a good understanding of law must include. And that is, of course, why, um, as I pointed out, so later legal positivists um, uh, used his theory as, as in a sense, a, uh, a jump off point um, to, to uh, develop theories that are more nuanced um, in their description of law um, by way of criticizing Austin's substantive legal theory. Okay, let me translate it. <gülüyor> e, hocamız Austin'in aslında belli bir felsefe yapma metodu olup olmadığını sorduk ve, e, ve hocamız Austin'in aslında metodolojik konuları tartışmak için çok fazla zaman harcamadığını söylüyor. Bu nedenle onun e, ona hangi metodolojinin atfedileceğine dair de kesin bir e, anlaşma olmadığını söylüyor. E, fakat yani Austin analiz ve normatif değerlendirme arasında keskin bir ayrım yapıyor. Bu bunun net olduğunu görüyoruz. E, hukuk felsefesinin tamamen <gülüyor> açıklayıcı olması gerektiğini ve aslında e, onun amacının yasanın ne olması gerektiğini, ne olduğunu göstermek. Ama aslında hocamız biraz e, yani hukukun özü e, özünü anlatma bağlamında da çok başarılı olmadığını söylüyor. Ee, bir tür kavramsal analiz yürüttüğünü Austin'in ve hukuki terimlerin açık ve net tanımlarını sunmakla ilgileniyor. Ee, fakat bu terimler e, genellikle gündelik e, dilde de biraz e, çelişiyor gibi gözüküyor. E, bu nedenle e, çok e, kabul etmek için, yani bu Austin'in tanımlarını e, kabul etmek için e, açıklama değerini, açıklama gücünü anlamak gerekiyor. E, fakat Hart'ın da söylediği gibi e, onun Austin tanımlarının e, hala tartışmalı olduğunu, tam olarak başarılı olmadığını görüyoruz. <gülüyor> Hocam, if you can uh, follow uh, with your Turkish, you can correct me anytime. <gülüyor> yes. Well, my Turkish is not good enough, unfortunately, to, to speak in Turkish myself. I'm very sorry for that. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> okay. Um, Okay, well, uh, I will move on to uh, today's debates. Uh, bugünün tartışmaları işte şu anda özgürlük ve haklar bağlamında uh, analitik felsefe bize ne sunuyor? Hocam, uh, what analytic philosophy offers us in terms of uh, working on uh, the concepts freedom and rights? 
Yes, so, so, so there's a lot that could be said about that. I'm, I'm going to try to just give a very, very brief um, account. So in, in debates about freedom and rights, I guess, um, one, one might distinguish as in debates about, about the law between an analytical and, and normative approach. So of course you might be interested in the question what rights and freedoms people uh, should, should be entitled to claim um, or what, what claims to rights and freedoms are morally justifiable um, in, in a legitimate, in a good state. So this is a normative question, but of course there's also uh, the, the, the prior question or the conceptual or analytic question, what is a right or what is the freedom, how should we understand these terms? And um, I guess um, analytical philosophy or, or philosophizing in the analytical tradition has made um, important contributions um, to, to answering these questions, um, which, which certainly uh, deserve to be highlighted and recognized. So um, I guess the most important um, uh, contribution really um, to, to the um, analysis of rights that was made in, in the analytic tradition is um, Hofeld's, Wesley Hofeld's distinction between um, different types of right. So the idea is that if you look at um, something like the right of property, for instance, um, which, which we talk about, I guess, in, in the law and in everyday language, if you try to analyze what, what it means for someone to have a right of property uh, in something, then um, you will realize that, that a right of property is really um, a, a composition or, or, or a conglomerate, I suppose, of um, a number of more fundamental or more basic rights. And what Hofeld tried to do um, was to distinguish and, and to classify um, the basic rights or the basic normative positions and to explain how they are combined into more complex rights, like a right to property. So <clears throat> he distinguishes between uh, claims, privileges, uh, powers, and immunities um, as four basic types of right. Um, so um, I guess a claim is um, a claim that you have against someone else um, that they do or not do something. So I suppose if I if I uh, have a right of property in something, then um, I have a claim against other people that they not use the thing without my permission. And that is one element of uh, a property right. But there are other elements of well, of course. Um, so if I own something, I have the right to use it. Um, uh, at least uh, with, within the bounds set by the law without violating other people's rights. That what, that's what um, Hofeld refers to as a liberty or a privilege, right? So um, if I own a car, I have the right to drive around in it. But I also have certain normative powers. So if I, if I own a car, for instance, um, if it's my property, I could give it to you as a gift, right? Or, or perhaps sell it to someone else. Um, and that is also an aspect of the right to property. And, and finally, of course, I, I am shielded against um, someone else selling my car. So you don't have the normative power to sell my car to someone else or to give it to another person as a gift. That is an immunity. And so um, these are different rights that, that come together that as a conglomerate or as a, as a molecule, I suppose, if you want to put it mm -hmm. in a chemical metaphor, make up um, a right of property. And so um, th this analysis is extremely helpful in, in disambiguating talk about rights because in, in legal and political affairs, you're, you're constantly confronted with rights language, but people don't always talk about um, the same type of right. And um, this Hofeldian scheme, of course, is extremely helpful as an analysis to understand exactly uh, what is claimed when, when rights language is used. Um, so that is one important um, contribution that analytical philosophy has made. Um, I suppose a second important contribution um, concerns, you might say, the, the, the function of the right. So, so what is it um, for someone um, to have a right? Um, what's the point of right, you might say? Um, and here there is the uh, famous debate that's still ongoing between a uh, camp of theorists who are uh, proponents of what is called the will theory and uh, proponents of a different camp who are uh, adherents to what is called the interest theory. So um, in the will theory, the idea is that the point of a right is really um, to give you a certain kind of control um, someone else's normative position. So um, 
if you have a right, that means that you are you are a tiny, a little sovereign, um, so to speak, in in your relationship to someone else. So, for instance, um, if I own my uh, my own car, if it is my property, right, then I can decide whether you should be allowed to drive it or not. I can give you permission or withhold it. And the idea is that the point of having rights is to exercise that kind of volitional control over um, someone else's obligations or or uh, uh, permissions. Mm -hmm. So that's the um, the will theory, and, and and the will theory, of course, has has an obvious drawback, which is that it, it seems to require that someone who's a rights bearer must be someone who has a will, who is who is capable of um, taking their own decisions on the basis of their own reflection and and uh, uh, practical reasoning, and that would make it very very difficult, obviously, to attribute rights. Um, to entities that do not satisfy this requirement, right? So you might you might think that um, people who who lack the capacity to decide rationally nevertheless have rights. Um, you might think that I don't know animals have rights, or or uh, that um, I don't know buildings have rights, perhaps in the extreme case, or that um, uh, small children who are not yet capable of taking rational decisions have rights. Um, and it seems that the will theory you find is difficult or has a hard time explaining how that is possible. And that is why some theorists argue that, well, the point of a right is that um, you have a constellation of, of these basic ingredients that Hofer talked about that protect someone's interests. Um, and that is, and it's the person whose interest is protected who should be regarded as the rights bearer. That is, um, the interest theory. So, so these two um, accounts of what, what the point or the purpose or the function of a right is um, uh, contend with each other in, in contemporary debate. And that is sort of an open discussion that is still um, ongoing. Um, just perhaps one, one word about, so I've talked about rights a little bit, I haven't said anything about freedom, but of course here in, in terms of freedom, you have the same uh, uh, two-step um, uh, sequence. So you can ask yourself first, what, what is liberty? What is freedom? Um, and of course, there are different accounts that have been given. So some people adhere to, to a Hobbesian account of, of liberty or freedom as um, non-interference on the part of others with one's own actions. And of course, there are other people who claim that liberty or freedom consists in the ability to exercise rational self-control. That is the the positive account of freedom. And recently, there is a what, what is billed as a third position, though there are doubts whether it really is an independent position. That is the idea of freedom as non-domination, where the idea is that you're free politically in particular if you are not subject to someone else's control, um, if there's no other person that can um, expand or restrict the sphere of your negative liberty in discretionary way. So, and of course, in, in, in in questions about what, what political liberty we think people ought to be granted um, in a state, um, we must clarify first what it is that we're talking about. And again, here, I think, I mean, analytical philosophy or analytical jurisprudence has made um, very, very valuable uh, contributions in recent years. Mm -hmm. I think there are uh, ongoing debates still, freedom and rights, defining them. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to ask that, um, uh, we talked about the will theory and the interest theory um, to protect uh, in interests. Um, do they uh, go to the normative area uh, during these debates and ask the, uh, to what extent uh, we should protect our interests? Well, I think that's that's a separate. I guess it would be argued that that is a separate question, right? So mm -hmm. um, the understanding of what a right is would, would not determine um, ideas about what rights people ought to have or what, what rights ought to be protected by the law. So I, I suppose that is a further um, a normative issue, but, but to discuss it um, in clear terms, I suppose, um, we have to understand first what, what a right is. And, and also, I mean, what, what its value to the person who has it consists in. I mean, otherwise, it's unlikely that we will be able to answer the, the, the further justificatory questions um, in a clear and perspicuous manner. And so, of course, I mean, the, the, the question what rights people should have just, I mean, that, that takes us into, um, into general political theory and, and in the um, competition between different political ideologies mm -hmm. that we are all too familiar with. 
Um, and, and that, of course, is a, is a debate that um, analytical philosophers or people who do political philosophy in an analytical vein have also made uh, important contributions to in, in recent decades. Mm -hmm. But we see in analytical philosophy that uh, only the definitions are uh, the basic components. Well, and we should first uh, define freedom and rights, then go to the normative area. Is this the first step? Yes, I think that's what what uh, how, how a good analytical philosopher would work. But I didn't I didn't mean to imply or to say that um, someone who's an analytical philosopher is therefore um, disbarred from from addressing normative questions. Right. So um, take again, for instance, the example of jurisprudence um, to go back to the to the first question. So we distinguish between analytical and normative jurisprudence by saying that. Well, analytical jurisprudence just asks what the law is, whereas normative jurisprudence tries to tell us, well, um, what content the law must have in order to be morally justified. But if these two projects, they're not somehow conflicting, right? They're complementary. So um, mm -hmm. one of the same author might, might be both um, uh, uh, offering a theory that tries to explain the, uh, the nature of law and, and also have normative views about the content of the law ought to be. And so HLA Hart, for instance, um, he, did have, or did, he did publish writings that engaged in questions of normative um, jurisprudence, uh, in, in particular in, in his advocacy for um, um, the rights of homosexuals, I think. Um, so clearly the, these, two, these two projects can be combined and the justificatory project can, can be addressed as much as the, um, um, the, uh, the, the descriptive project um, using the tools of analytical philosophy more broadly understood, right? As, um, as adapting the, um, the techniques of argument that, that people have developed in analytical philosophy more broadly. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what happened in, in political philosophy. I mean, the, the key event um, in, in the formation of an analytically oriented um, political philosophy was, was the publication, of course, of John Rawls's theory of justice in, in 1971. And um, a lot of modern political philosophy is uh, uh, proceeding by, by way of offering responses, uh, either critical or supportive to, to Rawls's political philosophy, just as a lot of contemporary jurisprudence is still uh, offering responses, whether critical or supportive to the ideas that Hart put forward in, in his book, The Concept of Law. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now I will uh, try to summarize it in Turkish. Um, bugünkü e, işte haklar ve özgürlük kavramları bağlamında analitik felsefenin bize aslında ne önerdiğini e, sormuştuk. E, çağdaş hukuk ve siyaset felsefesinde e, özgürlük ve haklar konusunda birçok farklı tartışma olduğunu gördük. Bu tartışmalar hem kavramsal yani analitik ve normatif e, olabiliyor. Bazı filozoflar bir hakkın veya bir özgürlüğün ne olduğunu ya da bir kişi için bir hak ve özgürlüğe sahip olmanın ne anlama geldiğini açıklamaya odaklanırken diğerlerinin hak iddialarının gerekçelendirmesiyle ya da insanların e, bu talepte hangi hakları haklı kıldığını, ne, e, yani talep ettikleri hakları ne şekilde e, temellendirdiklerini sorguladığını görüyoruz. E, Hofeld şemasını çok önemli buluyor hocamız burada. Onu özellikle vurguladı. Hakların kavramsal analizinin yapıldığı bir şema bu. E, ortak dilde bahsettiğimiz haklar e, en iyi temel Hofeld haklarının veya olayların e, yani işte iddialar, ayrıcalıklar, yetkiler e, gibi bunların moleküller, e, molekül benzetmesi yapıyor burada hocamız. Moleküler birleş, bileşimleri olarak analiz ediliyor. Mevcut bilimdeki önemli bir tartışma da hakların işleviyle ilgili. Yani kuramcıların iddia edeceği gibi başkalarının görevleri üzerinde kontrol sahibi olma hakkına sahip olmak mı? Yoksa bir Hofeld stilindeki olayların oluşumundan yararlanma hakkına sahip olmak mı? Son yıllarda da özgürlükle ilgili tartışmaların genellikle siyasi özgürlüğü nasıl anlaşılacağıyla ilgili olduğunu görüyoruz. Ee, yani buradaki soru e, hala devam eden, tartışılmaya devam eden bir soru olarak da hakim olmama olarak yani hükümdarlık harici müdahale etmeme özgürlüğünü indirgenemeyen farklı bir özgürlük biçimi var mı? Aslında bugünün sorusunun analitik felsefede bu olduğunu görüyoruz. Ee, 
Uh, well, well, I will uh, continue with um, human-related uh, question. And uh, since you uh, work on Schmidt, I wonder uh, how Schmidt describes uh, human. Is does he have a specific kind of definition, and does he uh, construct his philosophy uh, on this conception of human? Um, well, so I guess um, there are two remarks that, that I can um, make about this. So, so one of these is something that I'm, I'm sure many of you will be uh, familiar with um, because you, you have likely read um, the concept of the, the political. And um, you, you will recall that in, in the concept of the political, Schmidt uh, claims that um, in, in terms of one's conception of human nature, one, one might either have an optimistic or a pessimistic conception of human nature. So the optimistic conception is a conception that has it that human beings are morally perfectible, that perhaps um, civilization will develop in ways that um, allow us all to live together peacefully without deep conflicts of interest, without the need for um, a coercive state and um, legal sovereignty as, as things that restrain our aggressive impulses. And and Schmidt thinks that, that anarchism and liberalism as well are premised on this optimistic account of human nature. And um, of course, he, he rejects that account. So he thinks we should embrace um, uh, a, a less optimistic, a pessimistic account of human nature. And, and um, uh, he uses, I think, um, in, in the German text, the word böse. So he says that uh, all, all genuine political theories assume that uh, human beings are evil. Okay. Uh, whereas those evil is, is understood um, to indicate the idea that, um, that they will never, that there's no way to, to um, make them into non-aggressive, non-dangerous um, beings. And, and uh, he thinks that political philosophy should start out from that assumption. That's, of course, one of the reasons why he thinks that um, uh, an authoritarian political order with um, a strong sovereign is indispensable to uh, create social order. So um, you, you might think of it as, as a form of, of uh, a, a radical form of, of a view that people sometimes attribute to uh, Thomas Hobbes and, and to his description of what would happen if people had to live in a state of nature without the control mm -hmm. of the state. And so um, in this respect, so this is one sense, I guess, in which Schmidt's view is um, anthropological. Um, now, the, the other view, I, I guess, is, um, or the other remark I want to make is that, that Schmidt was not a humanist, okay? So, so we, of course, we, we, we uh, typically assume that um, on some basic level, all human beings enjoy certain fundamental rights um, and, and that um, all of us are, are moral agents who are deserving of a certain fundamental respect. Um, uh, fr from everyone else, including, of course, from political institutions that people might be subject to or be affected by. Um, and, and it seems to me that, that Schmidt, as far as I can see, he wasn't quite um, on board with that. So he's, he's a very um, anti-modern thinker in that respect. Um, so this comes out uh, in particular in his um, uh, musings on the notion of equality. So Schmidt, of course, um, claimed to, to offer a theory of democracy in some of his writings, and, and he was willing to recognize that um, the idea of democracy is, is tied up with the notion of equality. Mm -hmm. so in a democratic state, the people who are members of that state or citizens of that state are, in, in some sense, uh, equals. Um, they are equals in political status. But whenever Schmidt um, makes that point, he is concerned to emphasize that this equality is not to be confused with um, human equality that includes all human beings. It's, it's the equality only of members who belong to a certain political group, which of course will be defined not by the fact that all the members of the group are human, but by some other characteristics, whether it's, I suppose, a, a shared ethnicity or a shared religious belief or the shared adherence to some ideology uh, or whatever else it may be. And, and the idea is that equality and, and recognition of, of um, someone else as a moral agent takes place only within a community that's defined by some such exclusive characteristic. And so 
so Schmidt is very dismissive and, and scornful of the idea that, that there are moral ties that bind all human beings to each other and, and that um, attribute certain fundamental rights to all human beings. And so um, that, that's a terrible view, of course, so I don't, I don't share it, but uh, it's, it's, I guess, um, a second aspect, if you want to call it that, of, of the concept of human or humanity in Schmidt. So he is, he is departing from, from the mainstream of modern political and moral thought in that respect. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, doesn't it create a dilemma? To, because uh, Schmidt believes that human beings are essentially evil, but, right? By nature, we are evil. Uh, but uh, also he offers to um, create political groups and uh, sovereignty, uh, controlling mechanism. Uh, but doesn't he uh, think that uh, the controller uh, will be also an evil? So how uh, the system, the control system, will uh, work um, right, properly? Well, that's a very good question. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm not sure Schmidt had uh, a good answer to it. Um, I mean, his, his, his idea about this, as far as one can attribute a coherent view to him, I think would be to say that um, to, to avoid um, the problem that with, within a political community, some people are oppressed by others. Um, what's necessary is that the, that the people who are members of the community are seen to, um, are seen to, to share um, the fundamental opinions and interests. So he, he believes that a good community must be very, very homogenous and that um, in a good community, uh, as a result, um, deep conflicts of interests will be avoided. And then perhaps the problem of how to control um, uh, rulers does, does, no longer, um, uh, does no longer have the same pressing importance. Uh, and I mean, Schmidt himself, he thinks clearly in his, in his analysis of um, the Weimar constitution, which was a liberal democratic constitution, that the problem is not that um, the, the, the powers that be are not controlled strongly enough by the law, but that they are too controlled and that um, the, the, the process of mm -hmm. liberal constitutionalization of um, political affairs has, has made it too difficult for, say, the German political community to defend its interests, both against the people he sees as internal enemies and, and his external enemies in the international sphere. So, so he's concerned to weaken um, protections against tyranny. That is the that is the, the, the, the whole project to some extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, try to summarize it in Turkish again. Hocamızda uh, Şimit'in belli bir insanlık kavramının kavrayışı var mı diye sorduk. Ve bunun Şimit'in felsefesinde bir etkisi olup olmadığını, böyle bir kavramsallaştırma üzerine mi felsefesini kurup kurmadığını sorduk. Hocamız Şimit'in e, pesimist olarak tanımlanabilecek bir e, filozof olduğunu e, ifade ediyor ve kesinlikle bir humanist olarak tanımlanmayacağını söylüyor. E, Şimitin bir devletin e, ahlaki olarak insan haklarını saygı gösterme yükümlülüğü olduğunu düşünmediğini görüyoruz. E, ahlaki görüşleri de e, radikal bir şekilde toplulukçu olarak karşımıza çıkıyor. Yani bireylerin e, bireylere eşit olarak kabul ediyor fakat hepsinin eşit olmadığını yalnızca siyasi bir gruplara, politik gruplara dahil olanların e, eşit olduğunu ve ahlaki değeri yani bireylerin ancak bu koşulda ahlaki bir değeri sahip olduğunu söylüyor Şimit. Ve Şimit e, grupların uygun gör, gördükleri herhangi bir şekilde kendilerini savunma hakkına sahip olduğunu inanıyor. Ancak bireylerin iddialarına aynı derecede değer vermiyor. E, bu anlamda Şimit'i biraz anti-modern e, olarak tanımlayabiliyoruz. E, so, Hucam, uh, I would like to ask one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything new since a heart? <laughs> um, well, in, in legal philosophy, I, yes, of course, I guess. So, um, as I said earlier, I mean, heart, heart was... Um, um, uh, the founder to some extent of, of the modern international debate in, in jurisprudence um, who, who updated Austin's positivist theory in a way that seems much, much more capable to make sense of legal phenomena. And so um, one thing, of course, that Hart um, 
took from Austin and, and one view of Austin's that he defended was the claim that there isn't any necessary connection between law and morality, that um, it's perfectly possible for there to be um, legal rules that, that are unjust and morally unjustifiable. So um, in that respect, um, Hart remained a positivist and, and really um, after he, uh, he had published his main work, um, The Concept of Law, um, people began to debate about this question whether, whether there is, um, whether law and morality are separable in the, in the way that Hart presumed or not. And, and that has been the, the key debate in, in modern jurisprudence. And of course, there's, there's been a lot happening um, since Hart published the concept of law. So um, there, there's been an influential uh, modern version of natural law theory in, in Ronald Dworkin's work that's assailed Hart's um, separation thesis. Um, and uh, of course, there have been defenders of Hart's um, who, who have tried to, um, uh, to, re to rewrite his theory in ways that, that insulated against the criticisms that Dworkin has made. And so um, this, again, is, is a debate that's, that's continuing and in which many important um, uh, insights have been gained, I suppose, over time. So, yes, something, something has happened since Hart, but um, perhaps one, one might say that um, Hart's book was the Big Bang, in a sense, and he, he established um, a debate. And, and a lot of what, what's happened uh, after Hart was um, an attempt to work out the questions or the problems arising from his book. So, uh, and, and I think it's fair to say that uh, general jurisprudence is still in, in the process of doing that right now. Okay. There's um, no jurisprudence sorry. as well, so that is a different issue, obviously. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, Hart'ın hukuk kavramının uh, Hart'tan uh, bu yana aslında yeni bir şey olup olmadığını uh, sorduk. Uh, biraz tricky bir question oldu, soru oldu pardon. Hart'ın hukuk kavramının uh, aslında hala hukuk felsefesindeki en önemli metin olduğunu söylüyor. Bu Hart tarafından başlatılan tartışmanın aslında bir nevi büyük patlama gibi bir rolü olduğunu görüyoruz. Ama Dworkin'in doğal hukuk teorisinin yorumlayıcı versiyonu Hart'ın görüşlerine bir cevap olarak karşımıza çıkıyor ve Finis'in de aslında klasik doğal hukuku geleneğini canlandırma girişiminde bulunduğunu görüyoruz. Hocam, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Mr. Winks uh, writes in Karl Schmidt entry in SEP that sovereign dictatorship in Schmidt's uh, is an eminently democratic institution. Could he elaborate on this? And uh, how does he relate the concepts of, of separation of powers and sovereignty? Um, yeah, well, so I guess the, the, the answer to the, to the last question is simple. So I, I don't think Schmidt is a defender of the separation of powers. He rejects it, thinks that... Um, a uh, state in, in which the powers are separated um, and, and institutionally distributed onto independent organs of state is, is not going to be stable. So he, he rejects um, the separation of powers. Um, now, why is um, sovereign dictatorship um, democratic? So I guess um, to explain that, one, one needs to delve a little bit into how Schmidt understands the idea of dictatorship in general. So um, if, if you go back to the, um, uh, to, to the original Roman institution of dictatorship, then of course a, a dictator is not someone who is just some kind of uh, oppressor or tyrant or, or uh, someone who has unrightfully grabbed power in the state. So the tyrant, sorry, the, the dictator is someone who's been authorized by um, organs of the constitution um, to respond to um, a situation of emergency um, to try to end it so that the normal operation of the law can resume. So in other words, the, the dictator is someone who doesn't act um, by his own authority, but um, at the behest of um, other constitutional organs. Um, so he is, he is acting within the framework of an already established constitution. Um, so he's um, not also creator. Yes, yes, he's not right. the creator of the constitution, he's just a defender. Mm -hmm. Now, a sovereign, of course, on the other hand, is supposed to be someone who, who is not bound to the constitution, who stands above it, or who perhaps has the power to um, abolish a constitution and create a new constitution. And if you think that that is um, how a sovereign is to be understood, 
um, and compare it to, to the analysis of dictatorship that I gave, then it seems that, well, a dictator can't be sovereign and sovereign can't be a dictator, right? Um, and so how can there be um, sovereign dictatorship? So we would have to have someone who is, who is capable to create a constitution, uh, but who is still like the original Roman dictator acting not in its own name, but um, under the authority of some other um, authorizing power. Um, and Schmidt thinks that um, in a democracy, um, and especially in the moment where a democracy is founded, say in a revolution where a monarchy is overthrown and a democracy is first established, um, these two roles of a sovereign and a dictator, though they seem incompatible with each other, can fuse because there may be someone or a group of people um, who lead a revolutionary movement and who create a constitution in doing so if they're successful, but they're not doing that in their own name or by their own authority like a sovereign, but by appeal to the idea that they are representatives of the people um, whom they are trying to organize into a new community. Okay, so but, uh, quick question. Uh, they represent not ordinary people, right? The political groups. Yes, yeah, so so I mean, think think of the, the foundation of the Turkish Republic. Okay, so think of mm -hmm. uh, Ataturk and, and the people uh, around him who supported him and who were uh, working with them and, and fighting with them. And so um, suppose these were sovereign dictators. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so they created a constitution, um, but not as sovereign. So they did not lay claim to the uh, to, to the to the prerogative of so for sovereignty for themselves, like the Ottoman Sultan would have, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they claim to act on behalf of the Turkish people or in the name of the Turkish people. Um, and so um, if you do that, then you can be a sovereign, you can create a constitution, but you can also be a dictator because you can exercise power that really belongs to someone else, namely to the, to the Turkish people. And that's how sovereignty and dictatorship can, can come to be fused. But this can happen only in a democracy, right? Because it's a democratic idea, I suppose, that um, someone makes a constitution on behalf of a nation or a people um, who they claim to represent. So, so that is why, why Schmidt thinks that um, sovereign dictatorship is, is possible in a democracy and only in a democracy. And he also seems to think that this is the most authentic form of democracy, like right? it's the more uh, authentic form of democracy than what happens once a constitution has been created and people are elected to the parliament and debate with each other because in this um, exercise of constituent authority, um, the, the people appears as a unity um, or is represented as a unity. And Schmidt thinks that this is um, a higher form of democracy than the pluralist democracy that we see uh, one, once the constitution has come to be established. Okay. Uh, so we see, uh, sorry. Ee, Şimit'in aslında bir tiran e, e, olarak e, yani tiranlığın aslında e, o düzeni yaratan değil de savunucusu olarak gördüğünü söylüyor Şimit'in. E, sadece kendi çıkarı için değil aslında temsil ettiği insanlar için de e, bu tip bir e, hükümlerle e, hüküm koruma e, eylemine gittiğini görüyoruz. Ee, ve Şimit'in de aslında demokrasinin bu tip bir şekilde demokrasiyi üst bir e, e, yöntem olarak görüyor Şimit. E, ve tiranlığın ya da işte e, şeyin de e, pardon demokrasinin de ancak böyle bir ortamda e, çıkabileceğini ve sürdürülebileceğini görüyoruz. E, hocam e, one last question. E, what would you offer e, to, our, to your students? E, who uh, try to who will uh, decide to work on uh, analytic jurisprudence uh, what are the uh, secondary uh, reading recommendations of yours because the first hand ones are really difficult can be very difficult um well so i guess one i mean one good um uh, in introductory uh, textbook to to um uh, the uh, i guess the jurisprudential tradition that i was talking about is um um, a book by Nigel Simmons, um, which I think is called Central Central Problems in Jurisprudence or something like that. Um, so I think that's the, that's the book I'd recommend as a as a first um, introductory book to these issues. 
and it's it's um, okay. it's, it's quite it's quite a, a detailed account of, of these key positions, but it's certainly easier um, to digest. I mean, also in terms of the quantity of, of the readings, of course, than the uh, uh, the, the original text. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hujam. Uh, your comments and explanations were very uh, precious for us because uh, legal philosophy is uh, um, continues with uh, uh, today's world. We need to uh, to understand today's world. We need to know some theories, and also we should uh, we need to keep up with them. Um, so, uh, thank you for your explanations. Uh, they were very helpful for us. Yes, and th thank you for your interest. So it was my pleasure to um, to be with you today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I have more questions for you, but uh, we are time uh, out, uh, so I can uh, we can manage uh, another. We can arrange another meeting if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, according to our students' comments, uh, we can take it, and we if you have time to. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Arkadaşlar herkese teşekkür ederiz. Umarım sorularınızı düzgün bir şekilde açıklayabilmişimdir. Yorumlarınız olursa, sorularınız olursa mail yoluyla gene gönderebilirsiniz. Teşekkür ederiz. Hoşçakalın.